Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Amen. Not bad for on the spot, huh? Not bad at all. Oh, there's, that's so good. That was rich, man. There's just so much. It's, it's declaring, hey, you know, we, we, we pray about revival and we talk about revival and, and we throw that word around all the time, but the essence of revival is within my own self. It's, it's revival comes when I come back to God, when I say I want, a, I want a deeper experience with you, you God. And in, in that song, it was talking about, you know, bring me back to the fire, refine me again. Now, why in the world would anybody need to be refined again and again? It's because we exist in a world with temptations and sin and all those things. And, and even though we try so very hard to, to, to walk the straight and narrow, we, we do trip up and we do mess up. But, but we serve a God that says, come back, I'll refine you again. I'll refine you again. Over and over I will continue to purify you. And with a humble heart we seek God. What a beautiful song and what a beautiful time of worship that we had this morning. Amen? Man, I'm excited. That gets me pumped up and ready to roll. So let's get ready to roll. Now, people, don't get all quiet on me, right? I tell you that all the time. You can't get all quiet on me. Again, we're not going to leave here the same way we walked in, are we? Absolutely not. That being said, the kids are lined up at the back door. So kids, kids, you guys can be dismissed. Kirklunk, Kirklunk. Awesome stuff. All right, I've got for you adults, I've got a few quick announcements. Nothing major. Uh, hey, Chelsea, I totally forgot the order. Will you throw up the first announcement? Which one is it? Wednesday night stuff is starting up again. It's starting September 8th. We've got stuff for adults. The stuff for adults, the life group for adults, will we'll meet in the office complex just like always. That's the upper level of the office over there. We've got Bridge Kids. That will be meeting in the basement. And then we have the youth, the basement, which will meet in the basement of the office. You guys got all that straight? We know where we're going, right? Sort of, kind of. I don't. I'll have a map. No. But what we're doing is, is we're bringing back the Wednesday night dinner, and that will be from 5.30 to 6.15, and then the groups will run from 6.30 to 7.45. Sandy is going to come up and, and share with us kind of the meal um, Grab that mic, Amy. Amy, will you grab that mic? I know. It's okay. Some of you have asked what the Wednesday night meal do. We brought this back, but we have to have volunteers to continue it. So what we do, if you're comfortable with cooking and you, you like to be the lead of the dinner, you will have support, you will have help, but uh, we, we will plan a menu and the lead people will decide together what, what we're going to cook and then you'll be in charge of the kitchen. You get to tell we grunts what to do while they're there. And uh, if you're not comfortable in cooking, you can still help. You can come and cut up vegetables or put stuff on the stove or uh, get the tables and, and things ready. There's lots of prep that you could do also if you just want to volunteer. If you want to just help clean up, that would be great too because we always have pots and pans and, and anyone who's cooked around me know that somebody has to come behind me because I'm, and, and Terry's nodding his head and saying amen, and my husband, that cleans up after my mess. But, but uh, anyway, we'll need help doing the, the pots and pans and things like that. If you like to just wash dishes, that's good. And then the tables will have to be put away so they can have Wednesday night kids service there. So 
Those are the things that we do. If, if none of that, you just like to make dessert or something, you could sign up for a week and bring dessert. And uh, if we have a, two or three people bring dessert that night, then we have enough for, we're hoping, 70, 80, 90 people that we're feeding on Wednesday night. So uh, you can do any of those things. There is a sign up on the table back there. Uh, pray about it and say, okay, Lord, I wanna be used and God will use you and we'll find a place for you. Amen. So just to be clear too, Sandy, right? If somebody signs up, they're not locked into every Wednesday throughout the whole year. It, there'll be a, like a rotating schedule, right? And, and uh, so don't think if you sign up, you're, you're stuck every Wednesday night coming in doing those things. Um, again, many hands, you know, we, we distribute the load. And, and I've been down there when, when they're getting ready and it's no fun at all, is it? No. <laughs> No fun at all. Yeah, it is a great time. So think about that. If you've never attended any Wednesday night stuff, I would encourage you to, to if you've got kids, bring them to Bridge Kids. If you've got youth, get them into the youth stuff. If you're just an, an adult, just come on in and, and uh, get plugged into that. But also, you know, maybe step out of your comfort zone if you've never helped with anything like that before. Try, try stepping out and try doing that. It's, a, it's always a good time. All right, next announcement is... Yeah, Movie Under the Stars. Anybody come to Movie Under the Stars last year? Yeah. That was so much fun. It got a little cold, though, at the, at the end of it. Um, it's kind of the, our way of saying, hey, summer's over. We're going to celebrate one last time, and uh, we get together. So it's Friday, September 10th. Put that on your calendar. We're going to have a barbecue beforehand, like we did, did last year. So the barbecue starts at 630 so be here at 6.30, we'll hang out, we'll eat, we'll have fun, and then the movie starts at dark. When, you know, obviously if we're showing a movie outside, we have to let, let it get dark. If it's a cloudier day, it tends to get darker a little earlier, so we're not having a specific start time on that, but at dark, the movie starts, and the movie is wisdom? No. Wonder. I knew it was a, a W. <laughs> Wonder. The, so the, it's family-friendly, of course, we... We always do that. I suggested like Rambo or something. They were like, no, we can't show that. Okay, we'll do the other one. Um, but that's going to be fun. Join us for food, fun, and an outdoor movie. And here's a great idea. If, uh, you know, you're praying for five people, you got a list of five people you're praying for. And this is just a great opportunity to say, hey, our church is having in a an outdoor movie. You guys want to come to that? And we'll feed you and everything. So sometimes there's... The ultimate goal might be to get them to Jesus, right? That's always the ultimate goal. And church is in there somewhere, but sometimes a, a movie is a great way to begin that relationship and that conversation and even to get them on the church property. So think about that, pray about that, share about that. We have cards out there and on the table that you can grab, like little information cards you could pass out to people and say, hey, our church is doing this, you guys should come. Um, just another good thing to do. And then we have youth conference coming up, um, youth convention, uh, October 21st and 22nd. That is in Great Falls. Chelsea and Doyle, they're the ones to talk to, so uh, get with them if you're youths, if you're youths in here and you want to go to that. Talk to them. Um, parents, get the lowdown because we know how that goes. It's always good for the parents to get the lowdown. Um, but just another great thing, and what's nice is it's only in Great Falls. That's, that's quick and easy for us to get to, um, but it'll be good. So the 21st and the 22nd, the, the school, you're off those days out of school, right? So they always, every year, and this so happens to be around hunting season as well, but the 21st and 22nd, no school, so this gives you guys a cool opportunity and youth convention is always good it's always always good all right giving three ways to give always three ways to give um i love summer but summer's chaotic and people are all over the place and when school starts and the seasons change church seems to start to get back to whatever normal um, might be but giving is is something that we try to be consistent with um then we try to give you the easiest opportunities. You can give online at bridgehelena.com. 
course, the giving box is located at the back of the sanctuary and in the foyer. And you can mail it to 725 Granite Avenue. Pretty good stuff, right? We love to give because giving is just a portion of worship. And sometimes churches are like, hey, we love to give here. And we forget to say, hey, we love to worship. We love to sing. We love to get together. We love to hear the word. We love to eat on a Wednesday night. We love to go to life groups. We love all of those things because that's God's kind of that whole full meal deal, right? God gives us so many different opportunities to get with him and to spend time with him and to honor him. And and one of those ways and one of the simplest ways is with our finances. So we want to be faithful in that. Amen? You guys ready to get started? I'm ready to get started. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you again so much that we can come into your house this morning, that we can that we can get with you, that we can be around the brothers and sisters, that we can open this place for, for people who don't have a relationship with you, that know nothing about you. Lord, what a great plan you have called the church, the body, and, and the, really the direction you give us to, to, to live out and to walk in. Jesus, we thank you so much for that. Today, Holy Spirit, allow me to speak what you have for me to speak. Let me just shut my mouth if, it, if it's not from you. And like that song said, Lord, and I pray it every single week, don't let anybody, Lord, leave this building today, leave this sanctuary today the same way that they came in. Lord, we lift up what's going on in the world, Lord God, and in all the weather stuff that's going on from Haiti to, to the uh, eastern part of our, of our own nation. Lord God, we ask for protection, Lord God, upon the human lives that are there. And, and Lord, we also lift up Afghanistan. And Lord God, as we look at that and we say, what a, what a colossal mess. What a colossal failure, Lord. Within your economy, Lord God, you have everything within your hand. There's no surprises to you. And, and Lord, it helps us to better understand the, the consequence of sin in this world and the, the terrible effect that that, that that created throughout this church age. But Lord God, we lift up Afghanistan. We lift up the people there. We pray for safety, Lord God. We pray for peace. We pray for, for the martyrs. Lord God, that they may stand strong in the faith. We pray for the the Christians, the the recent converts, Lord God, that they may have confidence and security in who you are no matter what. So Lord God, this morning, we turn it all over to you and to you alone. Lord God, be glorified with everything I say. Lord God, be glorified with our worship and everything that comes out of our mouth this morning and throughout the day and throughout the week. Jesus, we love you. We pray this in your name and everyone said, amen. Amen. So we're going to have, I'm going to, I'm going to do my message and it's going to be all, all the same, but then we'll close. Jen's going to close with a song. It's going to be awesome. Um, Didn't she do good? for such short notice. Love it. Um, surprise, right? Be, be ready in season and out, I think. That's the verse we always throw it when we're in like, ooh. Uh, but then after service, Charmaine's gonna, gonna do some special music and we're gonna open up a time if you want to stay. We're gonna open up maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, where we can gather here and pray for what is going on in Afghanistan. Um, The church has got to stand together. It's the church, and we need to be praying for things like this. So if you're you're not too antsy to get out of here and God's tugging on on your heart, please, please just give us an extra 5, 10, 15 minutes so we can come together together and pray God's will, pray God's love, pray God's truth upon this situation. Amen. We're going to stay. Some of us will stay, some of us will go, but let's all keep, keep these world events that we're seeing um, in the forefront. And that's, that's what's so interesting is we're seeing so many global events going on right now, but I can say there's probably stuff that you're seeing within your own life going on as well. How many of you guys are still praying for your five people, right? We pray for five people and, and uh, boy, I just keep getting people talking about what is what is happening through that? 
what is happening through those prayers. And it's just so, so interesting. But I also know that when a church commits to prayer, when we, when we commit to something like this, man, we're praying for souls, right? The enemy does not lay down. And the enemy tries to get in and, and mess with people and mess with situations. So if you're, if you're having any of those weird, man, this is just weird, this is happening now, or, or conflicts within your life, or just weird things, know that the, that the enemy is coming against us because he doesn't want more people in church. He doesn't want more people to have a relationship with Jesus. That's this whole thing. He wants to get in between as many people as he can. And I'm going to ask you to keep praying even harder when that starts to happen. Be steadfast. Push through. Don't let the enemy have his way. Kind of thumb your nose at the enemy by intensifying your prayer. Amen? Amen. All right. So today, today we're going to be in a book of the Bible that, that really... it. it it's not preached out of very often, um, and it doesn't get a whole lot of attention. It's a very short book of the Bible, but what it lacks in length, boy, it makes up for in substance. So today's text is found in the book of Jude, and if you don't quite know where the book of Jude is, just go to the very last book of the Bible, and that's the book of Revelation, and you go one book before that. But don't go thumbing because it's only about a page or a page and a half long, but that's where we're going to be in the book of Jude. Now, before we get into the text that I want to focus on today, I want to get a quick understanding, kind of the, the who's and the why's of this wonderful book, this wonderful epistle, this wonderful letter of the Bible. Well, Jude was written by, well, Jude. So Jude wrote Jude. And that can get a little confusing sometimes throughout the Bible because it's like, well, that doesn't always happen. But, but Jude wrote Jude, and the, the author uniquely identifies himself as the brother of James. So we know that there's a brother named Jude and a brother named James. Now, the only brothers in the New Testament who have the names Jude and James happen to be the half-brother of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Now, did you know that Jesus had half-brothers? It's like half-brothers, wait, how does that, well, you got to remember that Joseph wasn't Jesus' true dad, the Holy Spirit, was, you know, all that. We'll talk about that more at Christmas, but it's interesting because when we read the gospel, we know that, that the family of Jesus didn't completely accept him all the way while he was in his ministry, but we know that, that after things had transpired and during the early church, James was actually the leader of the Jerusalem church, right? And Jude was a half-brother of Jesus, brother of James, was out there doing the good stuff as well to the point of having the authority to write a letter like this. Now, like I said, this is a, a very short book, but it's a very, very hard-hitting book, both for the original audience as well as for us today. Uh, we could say that the theme of Jude is contending for the faith. Contending as in fighting for the faith, um, doing whatever it takes for the faith. Something that maybe in the American church we take that a little for granted. It's like, man, I don't really have to contend for the faith or even my faith. It's, it's very easy to be a Christian. Well, I'll tell you this, every day it's getting a little bit harder and harder and harder to stand up for our faith, to contend for our faith. It is believed that Instead of a specific recipient, that this letter was intended to be circulated to a number of churches. So we know that when Paul wrote Corinthians or Galatians, he was titling that specifically for that church. Jude, on the other hand, is saying, I'm writing this letter because, because I need to get it to as many churches as possible because this same issue is being seen in many churches. And what is that issue? Well, the problem being addressed was false teachers. False teachers who were bringing in teaching that, that were not only wrong, but were leading people into unhealthy and even dangerous theology, right? Um, so let's, see, let's just see if this sounds familiar at all. There were teachers coming into the body and, and 
propagating the belief that salvation by grace allowed them to sin freely without consequence. Right? It's this idea that, that grace covers all. It's hyper grace, right? It means that Jesus loves me so much that I can do whatever I want. Whatever I want. And I'm covered by that grace. Along with this, they were, uh, these false teachers, they were denying the original apostate revelation and teaching about the person and about the nature of Jesus Christ. It was a big mess, right? Back then, you had people coming in and trying to influence churches in a bad way, trying to lead people out. And today, we have bad teaching that comes in, trying to influence people, trying to divert them, trying to pull them out. And it is that same pick and choose theology that we see so much of today um, in order, really, I think false teaching and this false theology is, is really a way to justify really our personal wants, our desires, and even our sins, right? And just like today, this bad, false, dangerous theology was, was bringing division within the body. See, good theology, God's theology, the truth, will... will will bring a congregation together. No matter how hard it is to hear, no matter what it requires us to do as asking forgiveness or making amends or reconciliation, God's theology always brings people together, but false theology, false teaching will always divide the body. I read stuff like this and I think, truly, there is nothing new under the sun. The same things the early church battled are the same things that we battle today. Now here's the main reason that we need to listen to this letter. It contains the most direct and forceful rebuke of false teachers. It's not a, oh, well, I guess that's kind of bad, and we, maybe we have it here a little bit, but it's not that big a deal. That's not Jude. That's, Jude is, is forceful in this. But in addition to that, we're going to see Jude as he transitions to the encouragement, even, even the preparation of true believers in the struggles that, that we will face, right? That's good stuff. That's meaty stuff. That's stuff that we can grab onto and apply right away. And don't you love that about Scripture in general? How upfront it is? All the time Scripture is upfront. It's especially upfront about the, the trials and the tribulations that living a life of, of faith inherently brings and the unending message of this reliance upon Christ no matter what the struggle in life is no matter what is going on we can rely upon Christ and, and this morning as I was getting ready and driving to church I was thinking about how relatively easy it is to be a Christian here in the United States, and I was, I was thinking about those Christians in Afghanistan right now where it's not very easy to be a Christian there right now. They're being threatened with death. Renounce or die. And in so many ways, when you're in a situation like that, your reliance on God goes up that much more. I'm not asking for persecution. I'm not wishing persecution on any of us, but I do know that through persecution... Our faith intensifies. So that's really what we're going to focus on today. And we will pick up, uh, we're going to pick up Jude in verse 17. Uh, Jude is so small, there's no chapters, so it's just verse 17. There's no chapter this or whatever, that's what I love about it. You can tell somebody, hey, I read a book of the Bible today. First John, Second John, Third John, Jude. Quick, easy but there's so much good in it. So verse 17 starts out saying this. There it is. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word but here 
is used as the transition really from a rebuke and a warning of the false teaching to the encouragement of the faithful. That's what makes this this book and so many other books so beautiful is, is if there is a rebuke, if there is a warning, they always have this transfer, this, this but section where it, where it switches into encouragement. Jude then states, you must remember, right? He says, you must remember. And that's important to understand because Jude is not speaking anything new here. He's not, he's not, he's not bringing this new revelation. Jude is simply appealing that they remember what has already been established. Again, this is really important. See, the Bible is the authoritative word of God. People in here, we believe that, right? God, man, that's his authoritative word. It's something that we can hold on to, literally hold on to it. We can open it up at any time. We can, we can read the living word of God. And that's exactly what it is. It's living and it is timeless. It contains moral teachings that testify to the wisdom and the integrity of God. And what is contained within the Bible is really everything we need to know. It's everything that we need to know. Yet as humans, as human beings, we have this insatiable hunger for more. Something more. Don't we need something more? Even though the Bible gives us everything we need. I think we crave more because inherently it's not more that we necessarily want, but rather different. Something that allows us to live within our passions and our desires and our sins. If we go down that road, we still want to be we still want to be a Christian, but we want to be, the, be able to do the things that, that we want to do. So there's got to, be, there's got to be more to this, right? We need somebody to, to open up our eyes and teach us that what we are doing, what we are thinking, what we are diving into, that, that it's really okay. See, this is the exact same issue that Jude is dealing with in the, the first 16 verses of this letter. By Jude instructing to remember, they are to recall. They're to recollect. They're they're supposed to go back, right? They're supposed to be mindful of these things that had already been spoken and already been established. You must remember the importance of sound theology and teaching. That's That's what Jude is trying to convey to them. And yes, for anybody grabs me after service or emails me or texts me. I know the arguments that the Bible was written so long ago and that what was meant for them way back then isn't necessarily meant for us today. However, the Bible is the only book that is alive and that is relevant throughout the ages. See, the Bible never goes out of style. It doesn't change with the generations. The truth that is contained within the Bible is is eternal truth. And we really need to pay attention to that. So as much as the audience Jude is, is writing to must remember, we also must make a diligent effort to remember, to go back to again and again and again and to be mindful of the word, the teachings, the examples that are contained within that. Now we see Jude lovingly temper his fervent passion by using the term beloved. Beloved, what a great word. What a great word to stick in there. Now if you have like the NIV or some other translation, some of those say dear friends. Dear friends, but but there's something about beloved. There's something about beloved that sets this apart. And this falls under the category of speaking the truth in love, right? Jude is absolutely concerned about them. And it's because of Jude's love for Christ, as well as his brothers and sisters in Christ, that he is writing this message in the very first place. 
it's not simply a rebuke. Jude does not put himself above everybody. Jude, Jude does not just want to flex his authority of his position, but rather he has a heart for the beloved, the church, those that are being preyed upon by false teachers. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not depart from, adapt, or change the previous teachings of the apostles, but rather trust and believe. Use those teachings as a standard to measure all teaching by, right? All teaching needs to be measured by the validity and the standard of the scriptures. Again, vitally important today. Measure everything you hear, read, or watch by the standard of Scripture. Now, everybody listen closely. You guys listening closely? Don't believe what I say simply because I have the title of pastor. Rather, check it against the standard of Scripture and then make your determination as to accept it or to toss it. Amen? we got to be doing that. we got to be checking things against Scripture. See, this is the biblical mode. Look at, look at 2, Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. It says this, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, yet you still need to remember them. I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall or remember these things, Peter is getting to the end of his earthly life. God has shown him, the Holy Spirit has kind of directed him, hey, this is how it's going to unfold. This is how things are going to look. Peter didn't go, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. What am I going to do? I need to run to the hills and try to avoid everybody. No, Peter said, this is important. This is important. My time is about done here, but I'm, 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 I'm imploring you guys, remember, remember what has been established within your life. That's an important message. Some of you in here today are listening online. Some of you need to remember what God has established in your life. Remember the words of the scriptures. See, when we remember, we recall, we go back to the Bible, everything works out a whole lot better. The newest, the greatest thing is not always the greatest thing. We, we, we look to the Bible, we remember and we recall. Well, now we get to this passage in Jude, and Jude is, Jude is really helping them. Jude's one of those helpful guys. He's like, not only I'm telling you to remember, but I'm going to kind of help you remember what I'm encouraging you to remember. Verse 18. Verse 18 says this. They said to you, In the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Now this is interesting and helps us to understand that the apostles had a wide-ranging ministry, right? And much of that ministry was presented orally. So everything that we can read in the Bible, that is not limited to their ministry. Did you know Paul did a whole lot of other things than than just what we read about him? He said a whole lot of other things that were inspired by God, but for some reason, God didn't inspire them to be written down. So we understand the apostles were out there, they were ministering them, they were presenting things, a lot of it was oral, it never got written down. That's important to understand. Because one of those prophecies was the prediction of scoffers who living ungodly lives would come against the true church, both, both internally and externally. Jude is reminding the church to be vigilant. We've got to be vigilant. We've got to have our eyes open. We've got to have our ears open. We've got to be aware. We've got to be grounded in the truth. We've got to be prepared when faced with ungodly mockers and scoffers. Are you guys prepared? 
As a church, are we prepared for that? And once again, if they needed it back then, because of what they were facing, how much more do we need it now? Here's what I think. This is just my thinking. Just to clarify it once more, this is, this is only Jason's thinking. I think that we are somewhat equipped to deal with scoffers, to deal with haters, to deal with bad philosophies that come from outside of the church. I think we're pretty good. I think we're aware of that. I think we're saying, oh, gosh, those are guys are way far off. Those guys, are, or those guys aren't Christian. That's not, that's not Christian-based or anything. Boy, we're prepared against that. What we are not always prepared to deal with is when these same things come from what, what, what we could call the umbrella of Christianity, right? And as crazy as that may sound, that's happening a lot. People claiming to be Christians, but their theology is not based in truth. It's based in something else, yet they're claiming to be a part of the church. And that's, that's really what Jude is saying, man, you've got to guard against that. You've got to be careful with that. Those that question the authority of Scripture or adapt Scripture so as to follow their own ungodly desires and passions. Again, we are to remember the warnings against such things as well as remember the only place to find truth. Verse 19. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. See, Jude labels three false, these false teachers by describing them with three characteristics we find in those who seek to, to pervert the truth. Number one, those who cause division. The goal of the enemy is to divide. Right? The ultimate goal of the enemy is to divide us from Christ himself. And everything that Christ is offering us, the sacrifice that he, that he gave for us. But the goal of the enemy is, his tactic is to, to divide not only me and Jesus, but me and people, me and brothers and sisters in Christ. See, division leads to seclusion. And seclusion leads to things like fear, insecurity, anger, offense, pride, and envy. And the longer we're divided, those things exponentially multiply more and more and more and more angry, and more and more fearful, and more and more insecure. So as Satan's goal is to divide, false teachers' goals are also to divide. And that can come in many different looks, cliques within churches. And, oh, this is our group, and we're a little bit more closer to God. Or, or, or we sit in this section, or we dress this way, or, or this is our income level, or this is our skin color, or this is where we live. There's all sorts of ways to propagate that div division Instead of simply saying, no, we seek to be a church for everyone. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter what your income level is. Doesn't matter what your skin color is. You can even come from California and we'll welcome you here. <laughs> Amen? No, come on, church. Amen? I know that's a hard one, but if we got to extend that out there and say, guys, come on in, because who needs Jesus more than people from California, for goodness sake? <laughs> All right, number two, Jude says worldly people. Worldly people. Now, if you have an NIV Bible, you're going to see the words, those who follow mere natural instincts. So following mere natural instincts, the law of the land, the, the world that we live in, to, to, to live that way, that, that determines that you're a worldly person. Now, the opposite of that is a, is a godly person who says, though I might live in this world, I'm not of this world. My outlook is different because it's been transformed from Jesus, so I look at things very differently. 
Jude here is saying false teachers are worldly people. They look at things that way. And this statement really has everything to do with fruit. See, there are many in church today, even pastors and leaders, that, that claim a level of spiritual superiority, superior knowledge, ultimate experience, yet their lives produce fruit that is on par or even below that is the common atheist. They are driven by their natural instincts instead of the righteousness that God has put into their lives. They are choosing the world over God. And then number three, Jude, Jude says, those devoid of the Spirit. Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Those that are, that are apart, they're devoid. They don't have the Holy Spirit. See, being devoid of the Holy Spirit is being apart or out of relationship with Christ. And therefore, out of relationship with the Father. Despite their charisma, their speaking style, or their large following. The fact is, false teachers are devoid, barren, lacking, or void of the Holy Spirit. What's that measure? What do we, could we have something that we could measure them by if we just talk about fruit and being devoid of the Spirit? Yeah, you, you, you measure everything against the Bible. We got stuff in Galatians. We got stuff all over this Bible that talks about good fruit versus bad fruit. And now in this passage, we get to another but. And it alerts to another transition. Jude is saying, guard against false Christians and their influence. And then he moves to verse 20 and 21. And it says this, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Again, here's this word again, beloved. It speaks to the, the, the compassion, maybe, maybe the urgency and the worry, the protection that Jude wants to, 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 to give to these people. Guys, okay, remember... Beloved, listen to me. Beloved. It puts the emphasis back on the believer and then goes on to instruct and encourage that believer. This is, this is for them, right? This is for them. But I'll tell you what, it's for us as well. So let's break this down. Number one. Number one says, as a Christian we are to be building ourselves up in our most holy faith. Christians build themselves up through the Holy Spirit and by having fellowship with the Lord. Right? I hope you guys have fellowship with the Lord on a daily basis. Multiple times during the day because we need to have that fellowship. In addition to that, we are built up when we surround ourselves with brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you guys have those people in your life um, that when you talk to them and when you're done talking, you're like, oh my gosh. Whew, felt like I just did 45 minutes of cardio. That was draining. It's important because we're giving out. We're trying to help that person, right? We're supposed to have these kind of, of conversations. We need to be involved in these kind of conversations but in many ways, boy, we're not getting built up. We're giving out so much. But then we have these other relationships, right? And we just hang out with brothers and sisters in Christ. And at the end, whew, man, I feel good. I'm encouraged. Iron sharpens iron, right? We're, we're, we're talking to each other. Hey, man, I just said, what's God doing in your life? And they started in, and I couldn't help but then to talk about how, how what God is doing in my life goes in with that. See, we need brothers and sisters, those that are on fire for Christ, those that are seeking a relationship with Christ, we need to be together with them. We need to be conversing with them. If the only time you talk to, people, to other Christians is on a Sunday morning, you need it more than on a Sunday morning, right? Yes, we are to, to influence the world, 
But we need to be built up both in the Lord and with, a, with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Another way, by studying the word, right? We, we build ourselves up in our most holy faith by getting into the Bible. There's too many people who just rely on a Sunday morning. That's, that's, their, that's their exposure to the Bible and it's not meant to be that way. Most of us have multiple Bibles at home. Many of us have multiple Bible apps on our phone because one's not enough. Even though that one contains every different translation of the Bible, we got to have both Oak Bible and Gideon's Bible and Bible Gateway and all these different things because we got to have the Word. got to have it on our phone. But how many times are we actually opening that up? I mean, how many times are we actually studying the Word? It's our daily bread, right? We need to be getting in the Word on a daily basis to help us build ourselves up in the most holy faith. And then another way is through prayer and worship. Not just on a Sunday morning, but definitely on a Sunday morning. But we pray, right? Don't just, don't just come to church on Sunday morning and pray and expect that to, to last you throughout the week, right? Don't just come to church on Sunday morning and worship and expect that to last us throughout the week. I know some of you guys put on the Christian radio station and sing, sing your hearts out in your cars. Man, that's pure worship. You're not worried about anybody around you. Get it on your headphones. When you're working out, find the station you want. Play it. Man, you're working out. You're getting, you're getting worship time in there. Everybody thinks you're crazy anyway. We live in a crazy world. It's okay. They can look at you. They can scoff at you. They can judge you. But who cares, man? You're convening with Jesus. So another way to build ourselves up is through prayer and through worship. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Number two. As Christians, we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. I love the way he words that. Because a legalistic society will say oh as Christians you are to keep yourself from sin and though there is truth to that the only way we can keep ourselves from sin is to keep ourselves in the love of God Jude is kind of to the point he's like I don't need to talk about that because if you're keeping yourself in the love of God man you're covered it is good God's love is through Jesus Christ correct right well, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So we understand that God's love comes through Jesus Christ. So those who depart or deny Christ, depart and deny the love of God. Can't have it both ways. God establishes those tenets, that theology, the rules, however you want to say it. God establishes that. The Father says, hey, the only way to the Father is through the Son, right? We gotta believe that. We gotta gotta live that. Rejecting the commandments and the teaching of Christ is rejecting his love and ultimately rejecting the Father, right, and the mercy that he wants to bestow to us. And then number three. Number three, as Christians, we are to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternity. To, to eternal life. We got to wait for the mercy. Wait, what does that mean? Waiting for the mercy. That seems so huge and, and so big and, and, and puts a responsibility upon me, right? As Christians, we don't want that responsibility. We want to be like these false teachers and say, I'm covered by grace. I can do whatever I want. I don't have to do anything. I got no skin in the game. I got no dog in the fight. I can just be, and God will love me no matter what. God will love you no matter what. But we have a responsibility to conduct ourselves in a manner. We are, have a responsibility to, to affix our attention, affix our attention upon his mercy. Mercy is defined as, as not getting what we deserve, right? So we understand that grace is, is getting a gift, that we don't deserve. We love that part, right? Oh, I, I just love getting gifts that I don't deserve because that's a gift. I don't have to do anything for that gift. 
But mercy, on the other hand, is, is God saying, I am not going to give you what you deserve, what you are guilty of. So by affixing our attention upon the Father's mercy, something comes into our life. It's a heaping dose of humility, saying, oh my gosh, God, I don't deserve and I never want to fall into the category of me thinking that I deserve this. And I never want to, want to take what you are extending to me wrong and being disrespectful with that. Lord, help me to affix my attention upon your mercy. Understanding that no matter how good I am or how good my works might be, salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. See, when we wrap it all together, we have now been reminded to be vigilant, right? To remember, to guard ourselves against false teachers that are going to try to come in and influence us, to divert us, to distract us, and to divide us. We have learned the characteristics of a false teacher, right? All in this these few verses we've learned all this and we see what we as followers of Christ need to be incorporating into our everyday lives in order to remain healthy to remain fruitful to remain strong within our faith then we get to verse 22 and 23 and it gives us some of the reasons. And it's they're pretty big reasons. We are to be doing everything that we have just previously read, right? Jude doesn't just leave it there. He said, now, now you need to do this because it's important. And why is it important? Well, let's look. And have mercy on those who, who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. See this passage right here. It helps us. It really it helps us in a general sense. But specifically, it helps us gain a, a greater compassion for those we are praying for. Oh, like our five people that we're praying for. What a great, what a great passage right there as related to the people that we are praying for. And, and really, Jude breaks people down into three categories, and it's very interesting how, how he does this. Category number one, it says, show mercy to those who have doubt. Show mercy. That same mercy that God has extended to you, show, show that mercy to those who have doubt. Wouldn't that be, hey, don't condemn them, right? But, but, but share that mercy what this is really saying, if you go back to the Greek and, and look at the structure of that word in these, these sentences, and what it's saying is, have mercy to those who are at odds with themselves. Those who are at odds with themselves. Are we to understand that anyone who does not have Christ is at odds with themselves? Absolutely, we are. That's exactly what Jude is saying. Those who have no understanding or a false understanding of Christ need to be dealt with really passion, patiently, um, gently, and, and lovingly as prescribed by the Holy Spirit. We're going we're gonna to add that on there, right? As prescribed by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. See, there's, a, there's an entire population out there that they just don't know about Jesus. And we need to be extending God's mercy to them so that we're not condemning them. We're not dragging them to church. We're not doing any of that. We're building relationships in order to introduce them to Jesus Christ. It's patient, it's gentle, it's loving, and it builds that relationship in order for them to obtain the revelation of Christ, salvation, an order in their life. Think about before you had Jesus. Your life was chaotic, right? I know mine was. 
And I couldn't even describe what that looks like. I just know now, because I've experienced Christ, how chaotic it actually is. Now, we deal with people outside of Jesus, worldly people, and, and sometimes that's pretty hard, isn't it? Be truthful. Sometimes it gets really hard. And, and that can take patience and grace on our part. I would ask you this. Do any of the five people on your list that you are praying for fit this category? Any of them? That they just have disorder in their life. Maybe they're not caught up into anything specific. They just don't have Jesus in general. Keep praying for those people. But look at what it says next. Number two, it says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. See, it's a distinction. It's like, hey, the, the general people just don't have Jesus. They have chaos. They don't have any order in their life. You need to deal with them patiently, lovingly. Be genuine with them. Bring them in. It might take a while. But, but it's okay that it sometimes takes a while. But now, now Jude switches over and he's like, well, this group, man, you've got to save others by snatching them. Snatching them. Grabbing them. Get them out of the fire. They're burning. There's an urgency here. See, there are some. And maybe, maybe this is some on your very list that need to be handled... Can we say in a more direct way? In a more direct way. We still extend the same grace and love and mercy, but, but we extend it in a more dynamic way. I, I would think that this would apply to those involved in behaviors and sins that are flat out dangerous. There's a danger going on here. There's a danger of, of losing them forever. Right? So we need to be more aggressive in how we treat these. Let me ask you this. Do we handle a drug abuser differently? Yeah, we do. Do we handle somebody wrapped up in sexual sin differently? Yeah, we do. Do we handle somebody struggling with suicidal thoughts differently? Yeah, we do. Do we handle somebody involved in satanic pre uh, pre practices differently? Yeah, we do, because there's an urgency there. There's a, there's a physical danger involved in all of those, and it's like, man, we got to be a little bit, I got to spend extra time, I got to pray extra hard, I need to have contact with this person, not once a month, not once a week, but probably once a day, I got to be presenting Christ to them now, because they need a definite right turn in their life, man. They need to get off the path that they're on. And again, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we employ grace and love. We just employ grace and love with a different level of urgency. Anybody on your list that is, falls into that category? It's like, man, they got one foot in the fire. Man, we got to snatch those guys. We got to snatch those people right out. And then number three. It says this, show mercy with fear to those who appear to be deep into the ungodly theology of the false teachers. Oh, goodness sakes. See, there's a group of people. And a lot of those are people that are within the church. We're to show mercy with fear to these. And fear here means we share the reality of what they are engaged in and how it, it runs in conflict and contrary to Christ and the Word. It's time to be on front with them. See, these are the people that have fallen into the path of the false teachers. These may be the false teachers themselves. They have a knowledge of who Christ is. It's not like the first group that's just out of order, man. They don't know anything about Jesus. We gently, we gently introduce Jesus. And the, and the second group, they're so wrapped up into something, they don't know what's going on. We snatch them out of the fire. But this third group, this third group, they're willingly engaging in false teaching, though they have a basis of biblical knowledge. They have turned from that and decided they want to follow the false teaching or propagate that false teaching. Fear here is to warn, 
in a way that invokes alarm or even terror wrapped up in the mercy of the Father. You're on the wrong path, man. You've got bad theology. What you're speaking is not contained in the Word. You cannot justify what you believe in terms of the truth. These are people that, that need to be addressed. And that's why the Holy Spirit's involvement is so important. Remember, these people are corrupted. They're corrupted by the world. They're corrupted by flesh. Even to the point of being infectious. But even here, God's grace and love can recover them. Even here, in all these categories, doesn't matter how chaotic or disordered their life is. Doesn't matter how successful there is. And they're relying upon their money. Doesn't matter about any of those things. Doesn't matter how wrapped up in sin. How deep that foot is in fire. And it doesn't matter how much bad theology or bad teaching or, or following that theology. Doesn't matter how much that is. God's grace and love can re recover them. Now maybe this last category, maybe there's someone, maybe there's someone on your list, someone who is engaged, even submersed themselves in false doctrine or false religion. Pray for them. Because in many ways, it's way easier to, to engage with a drug addict or an alcoholic. In many ways, it's easier to, to engage with the person in your workplace that really is seemingly not doing anything bad. They just have disorder because they don't have Jesus. The reason it's harder to engage with somebody who has followed a false doctrine, who has followed a false teacher is, remember, they seek division. They want to be superior. They're going to talk in a way that is superior, that they've had a greater revelation than you have had and that you can gain through the Bible. So in many ways, you're talking to somebody who has already set themselves above you and you're having to correct them and help them to understand that everything that they're standing on to be above you is false and crumbling. So it's hard. It's difficult. And it takes a lot of prayer. And it takes a lot of involvement with the Holy Spirit. But it's worth it. It's worth it to restore a brother or sister in any one of these categories to a right relationship with Christ. So hear me when I say, no one, no one, not even the most defiled sinner, not even the worst false teacher, not the biggest atheist, not the most horrendous person, is beyond salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We've got we to gotta understand it. We've got to look at that. We've got to be living our lives with that. Because after all, God extended His mercy and grace and love to you. There's a whole bunch of people out there. Jude's saying, Jude's saying, hey, be aware. Be aware of what's trying to come into the church. Be aware of, of people that are trying to influence you, but influence them back. Save those that are perishing and preach Jesus to those that think everything in life is based upon the worldly standard. See, not one, not one of them is beyond Jesus Christ and His love. Worship team, if you guys want to come on up here, I want to encourage you once again. Keep praying. Pray for your five and believe it. Right? Pray for your five and believe that that's God's will. Pray for your five and believe that God is going to do something great. We got to do that. We got to believe it. We've got to pray the heart of God and keep watching for opportunities. Keep watching for those God opportunities that He's bringing into your life and that He will continue to bring into your life. 
God is doing great things with this simple little five lines. Just five lines. But when we write people down and we commit to praying for them, amazing things start to happen. Amazing. Amazing coincidences start to happen. Well, there's no coincidences. If we continue, if we continue to pray, to pray God's heart, He will continue to astonish us, to amaze us, and involve us in the process that He has for people's lives. So keep that card handy. Keep it in front of you. We've been focusing on, on different things reasons and different ways and and it's the why we need to be praying for these people and it's the how God deals with with our prayers and how he he within their free will begins to work in their lives what an exciting time to be a Christian what an exciting time to pray for these five people what an exciting time to look for those opportunities. Like I said, there's opportunities. They're going to come up. There's life groups. There's, hey, Wednesday night dinner. Just invite them to Wednesday night dinner. Invite them to the movie. Invite them to barbecues. Invite them to women's group. Invite them to men's group. If they have kids, say, hey, I'll take your kids. We can take your kids. We'll drop them off. We'll stay with them. It's opening doors. It's just cracking those doors open. we got to have a heart for that. And Jude, boy, he spoke powerful truth. He didn't mess around. But man, when he throws those words like beloved in, we understand his heart right away. His heart was for the lost. His heart was for restoration. His heart was for protecting the flock. What a pastoral heart Jude had. That's something we can all learn from. Amen? Let's pray. Father, Wow, what a, what a powerful passage in Scripture. And, and Lord, what a, what a whole powerful book. As short as it is, Lord, the Holy Spirit inspiration upon that book. Well, it's amazing, just like every other book. Help us to read those words and not dismiss those words simply because Jude was writing to a group of churches way back then. But Lord God, help us to open up our hearts and even our intellect to say, that's valuable for me today. That has substance for me today. I can take those words and I can apply those today. Lord, I believe some people in here this morning, when, when, when it was written that, that it's just a chaotic lifestyle, that it's just chaos, there's disorder in those lives. I, I believe that pricked some people's hearts and they said, oh man, that's this person specifically. I, I, I'm going to pray a little differently. I'm going I'm to begin to pray that, that, that God, you bring order into their lives. And I also believe there's others in here this morning that are around those that need to be snatched from the fire. That they're living a lifestyle that is dangerous. They're living a lifestyle that... Uh, Boy, it's a lifestyle that maybe means there's a danger of them not being here tomorrow to hear your word. And, and Lord God, I, I, I believe an urgency came into some people this morning to say, boy, I, I need to pray differently and I need to watch for opportunities with a lot more clarity. And I know I need to act upon those opportunities right away. And then Lord God, I also believe that, that on some people's lists, there might contain people who have who have gotten off on a bad theology that have prescribed to false teachers. And, and Lord, with that understanding, we can pray differently to give us wisdom in speaking in that situation. To not feel like we are inferior in any way because, Lord, we're a temple of the Holy Spirit. We got you. We walk in your authority. But to start to give the right words in those situations. So Lord God, you have worked on us today. You've challenged us today. You have equipped us today. Let us feast upon your truth. Apply that to our lives first. And then take that to the world second. Jesus, we love you. We pray this in your name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. 
This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to bridgehelena.com. And we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.